Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of our Preaching to the Choir Ministries. Just a quick disclaimer real quick. I don't necessarily agree with everything that you're going to hear in this video that I'm mirroring in a moment. But the fact of the matter is I want to educate you guys on the various arguments that are against one save what we save. Uh, because the way the way, it, the way people were trying to talk about it in my Google Hangout last night, they're saying it as if um, it's the correct doctrine, it's the true doctrine, and everything else is wrong uh, outside of it and whatnot. So I want you guys to listen to what he's saying in this video. And then you make up your minds for yourselves whether or not you think that um, once they even always save is ironclad or whether or not um, there's truth to what I was saying at the hangout yesterday. This will be one of many videos I will be uploading to this channel to challenge this idea and just try to do something about this wolf pack mentality that these knuckleheads on YouTube have with trying to uh, tell you that you're wrong because you don't believe in once they always save. So watch this video, guys, and I hope you learned something. And enjoy. The scripture tells us to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Jude verse 3. Welcome to our study of answering denominational doctrines. In this series of lessons, we're going to note various doctrines that are promoted by denominational teachers and denominations themselves. We're going to look at what they say, compare that with the scripture so that we can help people see the truth of God. Many of these various doctrines are, are bought into by millions of people and the end result if they live these out in their life will be people being lost. And so as we think about these doctrines we invite you to understand two things. Number one, that our motivation in looking at these doctrines and examining them biblically is to help people get to heaven. We're saying these things because we love their eternal soul and we want you to go to heaven. Secondly, we want you to understand that we're here today to please God and to preach the truth in love. Ephesians 4 verse 15, as we say these things, we want to honor God and we want to say what the Bible says and ultimately we want to point out error to help people know God's truth and to be saved. Our first doctrine, which we're going to answer from the scriptures, is once saved, always saved. It is also known as the doctrine of you can't fall from grace or the perseverance of the saints. Now, what is this doctrine really all about? What's the core and center of this doctrine? In just a nutshell, it tells us that once I become a Christian, there's nothing I can do from that point on that will ever cause me to be lost. Once I obey the gospel, once I become a child of God, I can never do anything. I never have to worry about it. I'm not concerned about it. I can never again be lost. Now, let me represent this fairly by quoting from some of those men who do show us what this doctrine says. For example, Baptist preacher Sam Morris in a tract entitled, Do a Christian Sins? damn his soul, said this, We take the position that a Christian's sins do not damn his soul. The way a Christian lives, what he says, his character, his conduct, or his attitude toward other people have nothing whatever to do with the salvation of his soul. And all the sins he may commit from murder to idolatry, will not make his soul in any more danger. Now that's pretty clear. The way he lives, what he says, how he relates to other people, what he gets involved in, none of those things can ever cause him to be lost again. And so you can see, at least this man is logical in his belief. But let's quote from another man who also believes this way. In fact, this doctrine is not new. Here, here's a quotation even from the 50s that shows this has been around for a long time. For example, Bill Foster, Baptist preacher in Louisville, Kentucky, made this statement. If I killed my wife and mother and debauched a thousand women, I couldn't go to hell. In fact, I couldn't go to hell even if I wanted to. Now, that's pretty blatant. That's pretty abrasive. But that is the logical conclusion of this doctrine. Once a person's saved, even if he wants to, he can't go to hell. Why? Because once you're saved, they believe you're always saved and you can never fall from grace. Well, today we're going to be asking the question, what does the Bible teach about this doctrine? We're going to be asking the great questions of Jeremiah 37, 17. Is there any word from the Lord on this subject? And 
as Paul said in Romans 4 verse 3, what do the scriptures say? Today we're concerned with what does God say about this doctrine. And friend, be sure. Be sure. This doctrine is not taught in the Bible. In fact, the very first passage we're going to look at takes the exact language of false teachers and says the opposite of what they're saying. For example, notice Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4. How much more clear could it be than this? Paul says, You have become estranged or severed from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, listen to these words, you have fallen from grace. Now isn't that interesting? Here's a book that is written to Christians. Galatians chapter 1 clearly teaches, he's writing to saints, to those who are in the churches of Christ in Galatia, and to these Christians he says two very important things. You who try to be justified by law, and a Christian can try to go back and be justified by the law, he says you have first of all become severed from Christ. Now think about that image. We are the body. Christ is the head, we can get in sin in such a way, get involved in sin, that we decapitate the head from the body and we are no longer in fellowship with Christ. And look at the language of the latter part of that verse. To these Christians who got involved in sin, Paul said, you have fallen from grace. How clear is that? God clearly says in the exact language, a thousand years before people have come up with this idea, in the exact language of false teachers, God said to Christians, you already have fallen from grace. Now the idea here is clear, and especially in the language of the New Testament. In the Greek language, the word for for or from is the word ek. Now here's what some say about Galatians 5.4. Well, yeah, that says that, but it doesn't mean you're completely outside of Christ. Christ is in the center and you've just moved a little away from the center. You're not out of the circle yet. That's not the language of the New Testament. The Greek word ek literally means out of. Here's Christ. We are now outside of His blessings, of His benefits, and of His salvation. And so, yes, the Bible clearly teaches that a person can fall from grace, that once you're saved, that does not mean that you're always going to be saved. But you know, that's not, not all that the Bible says. That's not the only passage about once saved, always saved. Probably the clearest case example is that of Simon. In Acts chapter 8, Simon hears the gospel proclaimed. Now, he's been a magician. He's been a trickster. And around Acts chapter 8, verse 13, he hears the gospel. Simon believes and is also baptized. He becomes a child of God. And so make it clear in your mind. Simon, according to the scripture, is a Christian. Now, Simon sees that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit is given. He reverts back to that old lifestyle after becoming a Christian. And he says, I'll give you money if you give me that gift. And Peter says to him, your heart is not right in the sight of God. You're bound in iniquity, poisoned by bitterness. And I want you to notice what he says to Simon in Acts chapter 8 verse 20. Look at the clear language of this example. The Bible says, but Peter said to him, listen, your money perish with you. Because you thought the gift of God could be purchased with money. He says, you've got neither part nor portion in this matter. But notice what he said to Simon. He was in sin. He did something that was against the will of God. Your money's going to perish what? With you. In essence, he said to Simon, if you don't repent, your money's going to go to hell with you. How clear is this example? My friends, it is crystal clear. God said to Simon through his inspired apostle Peter, you are in sin, you have fallen from God's grace, and you're going to go to hell. You're going to perish if you don't change your ways. You know what Simon said? He said, pray for me. Peter told him to repent and pray, and he said, pray for me that none of the things that you have said will happen to me. Simon was afraid. Why, why was he afraid? Why be afraid if you can't be lost? Because he realized the truth. He was going to perish if he didn't change his way. And so understand clearly, Simon was a Christian. Simon got involved in iniquity or sin, and Simon was lost until he repented. 
that clearly teaches that a Christian sins after he obeys the gospel, a Christian sins can damn his soul if he doesn't repent and live faithful. But think about some more examples. For example, or let us illustrate through 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12. Now the example of 1 Corinthians is that of the people who followed Moses in the wilderness, those who complained, those who murmured, those who God allowed their bodies to die in the wilderness because of their sin. That's the background out of which 1 Corinthians 10 comes. And Paul in 1 Corinthians is writing to Christians. Some of these Christians are involved in division. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Some are suing one another. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Some are involved in sexual immorality. 1 Corinthians 5 and 6. And some are not living the way they ought to. And notice what he says to these Christians. In 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12, the scripture says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Let him who thinks he stands, you think you've got it right as a Christian, beware. Why? Lest you fall. Now some say, well, that's all good and well, but fall doesn't mean he's going to be lost forever. He's just going to move away from Christ, not outside of Christ, and, and he'll get back. He's still inside that area. That's not what the text says. That's not true according to the context. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 10 tells us exactly what God means. God says fall means to be destroyed by the destroyer. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 10. If these people are not careful, if they don't mend their ways and get right with God, they are going to be destroyed by none other than Satan himself and live with him for eternity. Now, be logical for a moment and ask yourself about this. If Paul were to say to Christians, take heed lest you fall and you could never fall, what does 1 Corinthians 10 12 mean? What's the point there? Why even say that? Writing to Christians and he says, Take heed lest you fall. If you can never fall, those words have absolutely no meaning to the child of God. But as we see the scriptures to be true concerning the fact that a Christian's sins can damn his soul, those words have great meaning. Think about Luke chapter 15, the example of the prodigal son. The son decides to take his inheritance, go spend it on wasteful or prodigal living. He takes all that money, goes to a far country, gets it, spends all that money, and eventually finds himself in the muck and the mire of the hog pen. He comes to his senses and said, I've sinned against God and I've sinned against heaven. I need to go back to my father and say, look, I'm not worthy to be a son. Make me a servant. Of course, the father's there with open arms to receive him. But do you understand what that represents? God is the Father. That Son represents any child of God who goes into sin and wastes his life on prodigal living. Was that man lost? You bet he was. He was separated from the blessings of the Father. He was separated from the benefits of the Father. He was no longer in the house of the Father. He was involved in sin. And until he said to himself, I've sinned and I've got to repent, he had not the fellowship of the Father anymore. The same is true for Christians. We can sin and ultimately be lost. For example, think about the words of 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10. Here Peter gives a warning to Christians that we must consider as it relates to sin. Notice these words. The Bible says, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. Why must a Christian make sure if he can never be unsure? Be sure, be diligent to make your calling and election sure. Wait a minute. If I'm a Christian, I'm sure, and if once saved, always saved is true, I don't have to worry about being unsure. Why be diligent? Why must I be diligent to make my calling and election sure? Well, 2 Peter 1.10 answers in the last part. Make sure so that we don't stumble and ultimately be lost. Friend, if I can never be lost, this verse has no meaning. Why do I need to make sure? Why do I need to be diligent? What do I got to worry about stumbling for if I can never, ever fall? And so, yes, the scriptures do teach that I can be lost. In fact, we can see this even as a principle of God relating to man from the Old Testament. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 24 is probably one of the clearest pictures of God's relation with man and man's relation with sin if he gets involved in it. 
Look in Ezekiel 18, verse 24, and notice the Bible says, But when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and does according to all the abominations that the wicked man does, shall he live? All the righteousness which he has done, listen, shall not be remembered because of the unfaithfulness of which he is guilty and the sin which he has committed, listen, because of them he shall die. Now notice from the text, this is a righteous man one who is right with God, one who's living the way he ought to at first, but then he gets involved in abomination, wickedness. And thus it's possible for him to sin and turn away from God. And what does the text say? All that righteousness which he has done, it shall not be remembered. If he gets involved in sin, he shall die because of that sin. And again, the dying represents the spiritual death. Ezekiel 18, 4, the soul who sins shall surely die. We're talking about spiritual separation. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, our sins separate us from a loving God. The wages of those sin is spiritual death. Romans 6, 23, and if a man remains in them, he'll perish for all eternity. And so again, look at this clear example. A man who's righteous gets involved in sin and God says that righteousness is not going to help him anymore. He's going to be lost unless he changes his ways. Think about 2 Peter chapter 2. Here's a picture of a Christian who gets caught up in sin again. His life becomes turned over to sin. What happens to this man? Is he still in a good, upright, noble state in that sin? No, it's quite the opposite. It's a disgusting picture. 2 Peter 2 verse 20 says, For if, talking about Christians, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled them in them and overcome. Listen to this. The latter end, their entanglement in sin after becoming a Christian, the latter end, is worse for them than the beginning. Why? It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. Look at the clear language here. If after they have escaped the pollutions of the world. That is, if after they've been cleansed from their sin, they've obeyed the gospel, they're Christians, they get entangled in them again, and they're overcome. There's a clear picture of a Christian whose sins overtake him again. He says, if this happens, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. It had been better for them not to have known the way of truth than to turn from the Holy Commandment. Well, how can it be better for them, uh, their first, better than the last? Because now, now they have tasted the good things of Christ. Now they know exactly what they're missing out on and how horrible will it be for that person who was a child of God, who had all the blessings of God, and who's sitting in hell saying, if I'd only remain faithful, I could have been in heaven. How can it be that these people are not in a lost state here? Well, it's clear that they are. Look at the disgusting images used. It's like a sow having washed returns to her wallowing in the mire. Is that a picture of someone who's still saved? Absolutely not. That's a picture of someone who was saved and went back into sin is now in a lost state. It's like a dog. And how disgusting is this? A dog returns to his own vomit? How disgusting, you say. That's the exact point. A person in that state, we would never say, is in a right state with God. This Christian got involved in sin and is now lost again, and it had been better for him had he never known the way of truth. Now he knows what he's missing out on. Think about the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 27. Paul was one who did change his life. He was formerly a blasphemer, one who persecuted Christians. He was there at the stoning of Stephen, but he changed his life. He became a child of God, but Paul recognized it was a battle that he could lose if he wasn't careful. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 27, Paul says, But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I've preached to others... 
I myself should be a castaway or be disqualified. Paul said, I've got to discipline my body. Why? If Paul can never be lost, what does he mean there? I've got to discipline my body, lest when I preach to others, lest when I tell others, live righteous, don't do these things, have the fruit of the Spirit, I should become a castaway. And the word there, castaway, is used in Hebrews 6 verse 8. And here's what Hebrews 6 verse 8 says that idea means. We're not talking about someone who's just a little further from Christ. Castaway or disqualified means someone who can be lost. Here's a perfect illustration. Same Greek word used in Hebrews 6 verse 8. And God says, but if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected. The idea there of disqualified, cast away, near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. What does cast away mean? Rejected, cursed. If they don't change, they're going to be burned. That's the idea Paul faced if he didn't discipline his body daily. And so, yes, Paul even had that struggle, that bite, that, that fight, that battle that he had to go through to make sure that he was faithful unto God. Another clear example is found in the book of Revelation. In the letters to the seven congregations, Jesus commends these congregations for their good works, and he also points out sin that if they don't change will cause them to be lost. Revelation 3, 5 is one of the clearest examples of how a Christian can ultimately be lost. Notice these words. The Bible says, Jesus speaking, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Now, Jesus is saying, if you're faithful, if you overcome, if you don't give in, I won't blot your name out. Now, wait a minute. That implies that there is a real possibility that those in the church, Christians, can have their names blotted out of the book of life. Why would Jesus make that statement if the possibility doesn't exist? If Jesus says, you overcome, you be faithful, I'll not blot your name out, you've also got to realize, implied from that is, if you don't be faithful, if you don't overcome, you will have your name blotted out of the book of life. And so this is a very strong teaching. Someone in the church, someone who is a child of God, can be blotted out of God's book and lost if he doesn't remain faithful. Well, let's deal with probably the most famous passage which those who believe, once saved, always saved, often use. There are passages that are misused whose true teaching is not pointed out that people try to say, well, doesn't this teach? The idea you're saying isn't true. And one of those is 1 John chapter 3 and verse 9. Notice the words of 1 John 3 verse 9. The Bible says, Whoever's been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he's been born of God. Is this passage teaching that there, it is impossible for a Christian to sin? Well, we've already looked at multiple examples in the rest of the Bible where that's not true. But let's notice that if this idea is true, it's not in accord with what John himself teaches in 1 John. For example... 1 John 1 verse 8, John says, If we say that we have no sin, writing to Christians, if we say we have no sin, we make him a liar and the truth is not in us. God, John's already said, if you take the view of 1 John 3 9 saying you don't sin, you make God a liar. That's not true. 1 John 2 verses 1 and 2, John says, If we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, and he's the propitiation for our sins. And so John says, don't say you don't sin. You do sin, and when you do sin, you've got a way to deal with it. And so, even in the book of 1 John, the idea here cannot be that we never sin. What is this verse teaching? The original Greek words here are in the continual case. The idea is if we continue to live a life of sin, we cannot be saved. John is teaching that a Christian cannot stay saved and continue in a life of sin. The Greek word for sin is continual in its action. And all the Greek scholars and lexicons agree that John is saying a Christian cannot continue in sin and still be pleasing to God. He envisions here not just a one-time act, but a continual lifestyle of sin. For example, the English Standard Version, NIV and other passages, translate it this way. No one 
born of God, here it is, makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him. He cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. 1 John 3 and verse 9. And that's really the sense of the language. As we noted, John's already said we do sin. If we, if we say we don't want to make God a liar, when we do, we've got an advocate, Jesus Christ. And so, yes, we do sin but we cannot be faithful to God and keep living a life of sin. You know the very passage, 1 John 3, 9, that these people use to teach once saved, always saved, when it's looked at correctly, teaches the exact opposite. You can't continue to live in sin and say you've got God's word in your heart and I'm a faithful child of God. It teaches the exact opposite. When it's correctly translated, correctly understood, it teaches the opposite of once saved, always saved. And so we ask you, have you bought into the idea that once you become a Christian, you can never, ever be lost? Well, that's not true. Jesus said this, be faithful until death, and I'll give you the crown of life. Revelation 2, verse 10. A person can so sin as to lose his eternal soul. But here's the good news. Although it's a possibility, God doesn't want it to happen, and He's given us everything we need to overcome sin. God doesn't want anyone to be lost, but all to come to salvation. 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. God's not slow concerning His promises, as some men count slowness, but He's long-suffering toward us, listen, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to salvation. God doesn't want us to be lost, and God, in His infinite wisdom, has given us the tools we need to be, stay, be saved. God's given us the Bible. It is the living, powerful Word of the Almighty God. Hebrews 4 verse 12. This Word, if put into our heart, is able to help us live correct lives. Psalm 119, 105. God's Word is a lamp to our feet and a light unto our path. And if we put the Word of God into our heart, it will help prevent sin in our life. And so in this first lesson, in answering denominational doctrines, let's clearly understand God says a Christian can so sin as to be lost. If you buy into the idea of once saved, always saved, though it may be comforting, friend, it will ultimately cost you your soul because you're not watching for sin. You're not maybe repenting of that sin like you ought to, and you don't think that sin can cause you to be lost anyway. And so may God help each of us to be good students of the Bible, to contend for the faith, and to say, as God says clearly in Scripture, we must be faithful until death. The Gospel of Christ is brought to you by loving, caring members of the Church of Christ. The McLish Avenue Church of Christ in Ardmore, Oklahoma, oversees this evangelistic effort. For a free CD or DVD of today's broadcast, please write to The Gospel of Christ, 607 McLish Avenue, Ardmore, Oklahoma, 73401. That's The Gospel of Christ, 607 McLish Avenue, Ardmore, Oklahoma, 73401. You may call 580-223-3289. Please visit us on the web at thegospelofchrist.com. We encourage you to attend the Church of Christ, where the Bible is loved and the gospel is preached. The gospel of Christ, and to God be the glory, and to 